lasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms I have blessed peace with my Lord so near Leaning on the everlasting arms Leaning, leaning Safe and secure from all alarms
completely to you. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all I am is yours. I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul, Lord. Surrender all I am is yours. I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you. Surrender all I am.
stories of what they think you're like But I heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night And you tell me that you're pleasing that I'm never alone You're a good, good man to you Yeah. 
up this morning to the book of Timothy as we continue our series through the book of Timothy. What a great worship service uh, to warm our hearts and to prepare us for thus saith the Lord God. First Timothy chapter 4. If you're finding your way there, want to make an announcement. I've had a few people to approach me about discipleship, discipleship training. So we're experimenting with that on Monday evenings. Now that's something that we hope uh, and pray as we go through some literature that we can uh, involve more people with that. As we kind of go through that class, then you know we're going to filter that out or, or at least turn over uh, where new people can come in that are interested in being a part of that. Just want everybody to know we're, we're working on that. It's a, it's a study called Gospel-Centered Community. It just teaches us about the gospel, how the gospel applies to our lives and how that affects everything else that we do on this side of eternity and also on the other side of eternity. But at the same time, trying to uh, be careful and not to spread any, spread any kind of infection. So we can get a sign-up list for that. If people are interested in that, then we would love to be able to uh, involve you in those studies as we finish them. First Timothy chapter four. But the spirit explicitly says that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. For it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. Let's pray. Father, we do bow before you this morning. We thank you. Father, that we can approach you. Father, thank you for what's most important, hopefully in all of our lives, which is our relationship with Christ. 
Father, I pray that we all would commit to endeavor on a journey together, growing and being discipled in the gospel. Father, applying it to our hearts and lives as we know that we need the Holy Spirit each and every day. Father, protecting us from hypocrisy and deceitful spirits and demonic forces. Father, thank you this morning. We are to be grateful. We are to be thankful. And one of the things that we should be thankful about is the Word of God. Father, that it is your absolute truth. Father, it's what we hang our lives on. It is our instruction manual. The Word of God teaches us. The Spirit of God uses it to reprove us, to correct us, to train us in righteousness, to help us to turn and repent from falsehood. Father, give us a great love for it this morning. It's not always easy. but it should always be fruitful. Help us not to turn away. Help us not to abandon what we know to be right, what we know to be true, what we know to be glorifying in your sight. Protect us. And it's in the name of Christ that we do pray. We ask, we plead. And Father, we intercede not only on the behalf of ourselves, but all people, that you would be most glorified in saving sinners through the blood of Christ. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Many of you have heard the proverbial statement or idiom, if you will, that I've got a wild hair. We've all used that. Some of you may be thinking something totally different in regards to that particular statement or that saying. In fact, your definition may not be anything like what I am referring to this morning. My definition of what a, high, a wild hair would be would be a whelm, a last minute interest that I've been known to take in the past. I've been known to jump into things last minute. And then when the new of that wears off or things don't go exactly the way I've calculated, then the first thing I do is jump off that stage, that bandwagon, if you will. There's a lot of things that I've done in life that to me at the time seemed like brilliant ideals, things that I thought would be great, things that I thought would work out for the betterment of my life and my family, and it just did not do that. It sounded good at the time, and I'm sure that you have encountered those kind of things. Unfortunately, there's people that treat the gospel of Jesus Christ and also the local church the same way. For a season, it seems like the right thing to do. For a season, it seems like that it fits our life. People that will seek religion because they believe that it will offer them relief of physical ailments or physical pain or added stress that they perhaps did or did not bring on themselves. We all know that our situations sometimes are not a direct situation of something that we've done, but nonetheless, it, it comes, and we have to deal with it, and we take life with every blow that comes our way. Years ago... I seen this most prevalent in the jail. Not that I was in jail, but that I worked at a county jail. And there would be people 
and probably well-meaning people because, listen, probably some of the greatest people that I've met in my life have been people that got caught doing something they shouldn't have done or should not have done. But when they come in, they, when they get sobered up or they're not on drugs anymore, they're some of the greatest people you'll ever rub elbows with. Down-to-earth human people that made mistakes. But a lot of them would come in and the first thing that they would find is what we as officers at the time would call jailhouse religion. Jailhouse religion. They was all about religion, all about God helping them, all about God getting them out of the situation that they were in until the day that they were released. And then they just seemed to walk off of that stage. It seemed to be only a wild hair, if you will. They did not return to the faith. They did not follow through with their commitment to what they would say, hey, God has delivered me. It's a very scary thing. In fact, we're warned here in Timothy chapter 4 of apostasy. We're warned here in Timothy chapter 4 of walking away from the faith. Now, we have to have a theological understanding that the Bible rightly divides itself and that the Bible does not contradict itself. And if we really believe this morning in what Scripture teaches us about salvation, that it is a work of God and that a true convert, someone that is following the Lord Jesus Christ, they believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, then Scripture teaches us they've experienced a changed heart. Whereby God has worked in them miraculously that they can see outside of themselves and see the creator and that they can love him and honor him. Yes, not perfectly here on this side of eternity, but now their heart is beating toward a relationship with their Lord. That's what scripture teaches to be what? The miracle of conversion. And theologically speaking, if you believe that the heart has to be changed in order to be Christian, then how does something that's been changed by God ever reverse itself back to unchanged? How do we go from a lost state in darkness, placed into the marvelous light of God's wonderful gospel, only to reverse that back to lostness again? We have a theological issue when we hold to that kind of theology that what God saves that God cannot keep, that what God changes, he cannot bring to completion. But yet scripture teaches us he can, he will, and it'll be so for his glory. So then we have to deal with what Paul is writing to young Timothy as he's he's working with the church of Ephesus. And how might that apply to us today? I want us to understand this morning that falling away is a very dangerous reality. Therefore, all believers must hold fast to the word of God and to prayer. Falling away, apostasy is a very dangerous reality, but not in regards to one losing their salvation. So we have to delve off into what Scripture is teaching us. And as we look at Scripture this morning, I hope that we are, one, warned by the many deceitful schemes of Satan. 
and how that he uses those schemes not only to infect the church of the living God, but to infect us as individual followers of God. What does apostasy really look like? There's two things that we can look at as we look at these passages of Scripture this morning. Number one, an apostate is characterized by a gradual falling away from the faith. An apostate is characterized by a gradual falling away from the faith. This is what Paul is saying to Timothy. He just finished up giving us a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, you can read that by common confession. Great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, and believed on in the world and taken up into glory. But, Paul says to Timothy, The Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, latter times meaning from the first advent to the second advent, no one knows when the coming of Christ will take place. In fact, Jesus reminds his disciples that it's not for you to know times or epics which my Father has fixed in his own decree. But you are to be witnesses of mine, starting in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. If Jesus' disciples did not know when the last time was going to be, then we most certainly do not know when the last time will be. But what we do know is from the first advent of Christ until the second coming and consummation of his glorious church that the Spirit explicitly says that in these latter times, some will fall away from the faith paying attention to deceitful spirits and and doctrines of demons by means of hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. We must understand as believers in Christ, as, as commissioned people to take care of the word of God and the church, one, by protecting her, that, that not all who profess faith, not all who have quote unquote experienced something that it might not be conversion. Now that's hard to say. That's hard to have to think through, but again, the Bible rightly divides itself. One of the parables that we have in Jesus is explaining this is the seeds that fell on many types of grounds. We can hardly refute, in fact, we cannot refute what Jesus is saying. Those seeds fell on many types of ground. But there's only one out of all of those seeds that grew. Now, some looked like they were going to grow. But then if you read the parable, things began to happen, cares of this world, temptation came, all kinds of things. And what happened? They were choked out and they did not grow. But there's one seed that fell on rich ground which represents the conversion experience of a person. There's one seed which is the word of God where the Holy Spirit is making it fertile. And what does that seed do in that parable? produces fruits. Either we're going to say God is strong enough to save us and not only save us and keep us saved, or he's not strong enough to do that. I don't want to put that kind of responsibility in my own life. There's a process called sanctification. And yes, we as believers are are engaged in that process whereby we are growing in our faith. And yes, it is true that we make mistakes of our lives. It is true that we sometimes falter. And it is true that there's not a time in our life that we're going to be to the point of sinless perfection. There's only one man that walked the face of this earth that was sinless and it was Christ. 
So I understand theologically speaking, no believer is going to be perfect. No believer is going to have it all together. But there is a change that takes place in the heart of people, God's people, that gives us a desire and a love for the gospel of Jesus Christ, a perseverance and a willingness to keep on marching and walking. And when we get knocked down, then the Spirit helps us get up again. But we still have to deal with apostasy because it's mentioned several times in Scripture that some, as Paul writes to Timothy, they will fall away from the faith. In fact, the Spirit himself explicitly says that in these latter times, some will fall away from the faith. Timothy is dealing here in context with false teachers who believe themselves to be what? To be right with God. But they are only bringing in destructive heresy. They are playing on a totally different playing field than God's word. And Timothy and the church of Ephesus, Paul is saying, must realize that. In other words, they are not really pursuing the, the love relationship that God brings in conversion. It's not that they're making a few mistakes. It's not that there's accountability here. It is running headlong in demonic force. It is running headlong and giving in to false doctrines such as asceticism. Do this and don't do this. Stay away from this. Abstain from marriage. Don't eat this food or that food. And these things will make you right with God. And that's just simply not the case. Jesus makes us right with God. We come unto him because his burdens are light. Because his way has already been paved. Because he has already paid the price. We see examples of people walking away from the faith even in other books of the, of, of the Bible. 1 John 2, uh, verse 19, it's a situation much like what Timothy here is dealing with. In, in, in 1 John, we read they went out from us. They're fighting against Gnosticism in that particular context. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. Had they been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out so that it would be shown that they are not all of us. We have to be careful, especially if God's word is pointing us in a direction. That's why it is so important, emphatically so, that we lean on the word of God and the word of God alone. Emphatically so that we trust the spirit of God and the spirit of God alone. And we only know that through the word of God. Because we all, all know that we go through seasons and we go through times where we feel like, what if God is leading us in this particular direction? How do we know that we need to go in that direction? By making that decision off of our feelings or by going to the word of God and filtering every decision through his word? Because there's not a decision in life that, that can be made. If made by the word of God, it's the right way to do it. But there's, there's all kinds of decisions and people would say, well, you can make this decision based off the word of God because it's black and white and it's cut and dry. But you really can't make this decision because God's word doesn't say anything about this particular decision. So now I've got you, pastor. How are we going to make that particular decision? Well, God's word has commands. God's word has principles and God's word has freedom. And most of the time we run to the Bible to make that decision. We don't see any commands. And then we say, hey, we're free to do it. And we've missed the boat totally. Because there's all kinds of principles around God's word that helps us to grow, to understand. We do not want to be in that camp 
that is not trusting in the word of God as being not only inerrant, but sufficient. To not only teach us about God and who we are, but to teach us how we are to live our life for his glory and how we are to operate in a way that brings him honor and glory. I remember at a very young age, I went through one of these experiences that I'm telling you about. We were on our way back from a vacation Bible school. And I can remember, I was, I was in the car with a couple ladies that I think meant well. They meant well. But they were, instead of engaging in the gospel, it was more or less a guilt thing. It was a scare you into this. And so we began to talk, or they began to talk about hell and how bad hell is going to be and the pains of it. And then I remember the question, do you know where you're going to go if we have a car wreck? Well... As an 11, 12-year-old boy, I was terrified. Terrified. I thought, well, I don't want to go to the place you just described to me. I don't want to live there. Well, here's what you have to do. We wheel the car around and we go back to the church and, 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 and I'm ushered into an office and guy comes in, he says, listen, You don't want to go there. No, sir, I do not. Then repeat this prayer. And I willingly repeated it. You're great. You're great. God's not a liar. He says if you ask him into your heart, then he will save you. Well, I I didn't know. The only thing I can remember is walking out of there, I didn't feel any different, not that salvation's all about a feeling. I can tell you this later on, I didn't understand the gospel. I didn't understand it. I didn't wrap my mind around the gospel message. I didn't really know or understand what Jesus had done for me. All I know is I was declared saved that day and for that day, that was good enough. It was great. But you know what happened? Is I never had a love for the gospel. I never had a love for the church. I didn't even really understand what the church was all about. It was a place that you went and and, and you said hi to people and you worshiped and, and I didn't know what worship was. I didn't know Christ. I didn't know him personally or intimately. I didn't have no conviction of sin, no turning away from who I was at that time. I just know that, praise the Lord, I must be right. But I went back. In fact, I didn't go back. I stayed where I was that day. Do you see how easy that is? We must be careful. We must care about souls. We must care about people. But I'm afraid that there's a lot of people that have experienced that particular thing. This is not to discourage or to hurt anyone or to crush anyone or to give anyone any kind of doubt, but we must be careful to disciple people, to follow God's word, to put our stake in the ground at God's word because satanic things will happen and then it will come from well-meaning people. Demonic attacks can infiltrate the church and it will come sometimes at the expense of well-meaning people. There's a few things that we need to see 
as we look at this particular movement, that the falling away happens gradually. In verse 1, we see here an apostate is brought to perversion by demonic forces. This is what Paul is writing to Timothy. We cannot think or we cannot forget, better to say, that Satan is actively at work in the congregation, not only to tear it apart, but to dishonor God to lead people astray from the truth of the gospel. Demons are evil spirits and something that we need to deal with as believers daily. In fact, Paul tells us in Corinthians, what does Satan do? He disguises himself as an angel of light. He says, therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. That's 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14 through 15. This is why Paul saying the Spirit explicitly says in these latter times, some will fall away. And how will they fall away? Because they're paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. It will be a slow perversion through things that appear to be right. It will be a slow perversion through things that perhaps we've done all of our lives. That we're giving more allegiance to those things than we are to the gospel and to the word of God as being the word of God. And we have to be careful. When someone is lost, but yet plugged into the church, they are susceptible to the schemes of satanic attack without even knowing that they're being used in that way. Believers need to be careful. We are still sinners and we still need the gospel each and every day. Have you ever been a part of a church where you see the workings happening and, and you begin to see a lot of discord and a lot of things and it would be over things that really should not split the church. It will be over peripheral things that should never cause two people that love Christ to separate. But yet it happens. What do we call that? The glory of God? The will of God? No. Satanic attacks. We have to be on guard. Because Satan is actively working. He is going to and from seeking whom he may devour. That he mess up God's kingdom. Now the good thing about this is, is God can't thwart God's kingdom. Christ has already won the victory. The victory has been won by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can be saved. We can experience conversion. We can walk in newness of life, but never in a way that we've let our guard down. Never in a way that we let demonic forces and evil doctrines infiltrate the church in a way that it splits and it divides and it separates. People that will call themselves believers. And care not about God's glory. Is not scriptural. There's been several things that I've encountered throughout ministry of which many of you probably have encountered, but probably one of the most hurtful things was what I refer to as letter writers. In one of my ministry, past ministries, there were a group of people or maybe just a person, not sure, that was anonymously sending letters, not only to me and to my wife and to my staff, but to my kids' school teachers, to 15 or 16 other churches in the community, telling me how bad of a person I am, how bad of a person my wife is, how bad of a person my children are, 
went through and done the homework on people in the congregation and pulled out all kinds of skeletons and what we would call garbage on people's lives that happened 20, 25, 30 years ago. And they'd done this for two solid years. Trying to thwart the church, trying to divide it. Hurtful. Now, I've learned since then, there's other men of God that's went through that. And I've learned since then, if it comes anonymously, don't read it. it shouldn't give, you shouldn't give it time of day if they can't put their name on it because that's most certainly not biblical. We're to go to our brother and sister. And, and I announced from the pulpit several times, hey, you have some legitimate concerns in these letters. Come to us. We'll talk with you. We'll pray through it. We'll work through it. Perhaps there's things I need to repent of. What have I done wrong but would not stop for two years? But in the letters, they said they were Christian, that they were Christ-like, that they were devoted to the gospel. And I thought, that's so counterproductive. That's, no, you can't be when you bring that kind of turmoil to the church, when you want to be that dividing factor in the church, when you can't come and do what God's word says and talk it over and even be able to agree to disagree, but you walk away with the same spirit and that is a spirit for Jesus, a spirit for loving Christ, a spirit for exalting and discipling and helping other people. Praise God, after two years, it quit. And it done right opposite of what they wanted. It made leadership stronger and the church began to grow. But it was a rough two years. I say all that to say this, we cannot, as a church, if we're building our foundation on the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that is the only foundation that will stand, then we must stand strong. And thus saith the Lord God. And we must not be too naive to think that even professing believers will infiltrate the church and yet they might not have a grasp on the gospel of Jesus Christ and begin to teach things that are not true. An apostate brings about perversion of God's created order. Look at verse 3. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. When someone has lost all feelings to their conscience, they are what? They're open and susceptible to reordering God's created world. They're open and ready to change whatever they need to change. And Paul calls attention here to two features that are characterized by what we've read. And these heretics, these people that are teaching false doctrine first, some of the false teachers were what? They didn't want people to get married. Paul's warning in 1 Timothy 5, 11 through 15 indicates that younger widows in Ephesus may have been influenced by some of these prohibitations. The heretics who supported these views probably felt that abstinence from marriage was the means to a healthier degree, if you will, of holiness. I'm more holy than you because I'm able to discipline myself better than them. You ever felt that way? I've been there. Not in marriage, but think, do we not have a habit of comparing ourselves to other people? I'm not as bad as that person. Therefore, we're elevating ourselves to the pedestal. I don't do the things that they do. And and we think that yet this book's not relevant. It is relevant. We may not be abstaining from marriage in certain foods because we live in Alabama, Arley, the South. We love our food. And we're against any doctrine that says otherwise. But we do it when we compare ourselves to other people. 
It's not about that other person. It's about you standing before a holy and a just God. That's what it's about. And when you stand up to the tribunal of God, guess what? You're not good. No one's good. It is by the gracious work of Christ. It is by his righteousness and his righteousness alone. So therefore, when we look out across the congregation and we see and we know of things that people are doing and we use that as a leverage to make ourselves feel a lot better about who we are, at the end of the day, when we stand before a holy God, his word tells us we are doomed apart from Jesus. Even if the only thing we've ever done is said a little white lie, we've broken the commands of God and therefore guilty before him. That's a scary thing. We live in a culture today that's undergoing some of the very things that we're talking about, some of the things that the Ephesian church was encountered with, and it might be a little different But it is the result of Satan. It is the result of demonic forces. And it is the result of people with a seared conscience that buy into a system that we call sometimes the American dream. People have taught themselves that God just wants them to be happy despite what his word teaches. We have people who call themselves adamant followers of Christ in the Christian faith who believe that God approves of all kinds of sins. In fact, they were created for that. You see how wrong that sounds compared to Scripture. God does love us. God does want us to have good things. God does want us to enjoy life. God created these things to be good, such as marriage and such as food. But never does God want us to exalt that and be into that more than we are into him and our relationship to him and our love for him. Falling away is dangerous. It's a dangerous reality. And therefore, all believers must hold fast to the word of God in prayer, which leads us to the second thing I want us to see real quickly. Apostasy is overcome by means of the word of God and prayer. Look at verse four and five. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. For it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. Now what I don't want you to take me to say is that one can be saved, truly saved and lost a week later or a month later or two or three years later. Scripture does not teach that. When God changes the hearts, It's changed. When one trusts in the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're saved. Praise the Lord for that. But we need to be careful for false things. And this was the context here uh, that Timothy and Paul were dealing with asceticism. It's a false teaching that was going around the churches in Timothy's time. And this is what it taught, that the physical things such as the body is closely connected to Gnosticism. Body and food or material wealth is an evil thing and it should be abstained from in order for one to be right with the Creator. In other words, a believer should renounce the physical pleasures to focus on the spiritual matters of life. These false teachers were teaching this false theology in the church at Ephesus due to their being used by Satan and demonic forces. You look throughout church history, you see monasteries, You see different religions using this kind of asceticism uh, in order to discipline themselves into a corner, to run off in some desert because we're better than that group and we're going to deny ourselves this food and we're not going to marry because that's wrong. That sounds so foreign to us because we think that's crazy, that's ludicrous. Nobody here believes that, but yet we do it sometimes in our legalistic attitudes about Scripture. Do this list and don't do this list. 
and we'll be okay. And we know that that's not the truth. Apostasy is overcome by means of the word of God. Number one and two, prayer. There should be a healthy concern in every one of our lives, even those that are professing faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There should be an ever-present awareness in our own hearts of, of my wanting to wander away from the gospel of Jesus Christ, my wanting to take the reins or the wheel into my own hands and live my life the way I want to live it, the, the attitude that we can have Jesus and the world too, or the attitude that I can serve Jesus on particular times of the week and yet not have it as a walk, a petty patheo, a walk in the gospel. It is an action verb that when one repents and believes in the gospel, they repent and believe in the gospel the next day. And they repent and they believe in the gospel the next day. And they repent and they believe in the gospel the next month and the next year and the next 10 years and 20 years and 30 years until Christ calls them home. Why? Because conversion is primarily God. And God is changing men and women's hearts for the glory of God. So how do we stay clear of apostasy? We do it by means of his word and prayer. Throughout church history, many groups have tried to gain God's approval by excluding themselves from physical pleasures. That God indeed has created to be good. Many types of food or marriage or letting their, telling their ministers they can't marry. We know what that's causing in a lot of ways. It's causing sin. These are things that God created to be good and that's what Paul's telling Timothy. Don't let these come in. Don't let them bring this damnable uh, doctrines into the church because everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received, what? With gratitude for it is sanctified by means of his word and prayer. That should be encouraging for the New Testament church and for the glory of God. As we move forward, as NBC moves forward, there's some application here, is that one, we need to be aware of our surroundings, the satanic attacks that come on us. They will come. We're to put on the whole what? Armor of God that we may withstand the fiery darts of Satan. They're not going to come. They're not going to go away until we are in glory and it's been consummated. Paul tells us we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. That would be easy, right? We know our opponent's coming. We know how to deal with it. We know how to alleviate it. But that's not the case. We're not wrestling as if we're wrestling against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against principalities, evil forces, wickedness, of which here Paul says, the Spirit explicitly says, in latter times, these are going to be the things that the church will come up against. And we warn against apostasy and apostatizing and pushing away from the faith, one, by discipleship in the word of God, because this is what Paul is saying, the word of God and prayer. We're discipling people for the glory of God and we're praying that the Lord will continue to walk with us as we march forward for the glory of God to reach more people for his glory and do what he's called us to do. Does that mean we're always going to agree? No, we can agree to disagree on a lot of things. But the one thing we must agree on and all stand firm on is there's only one way to heaven and it's Jesus. And we want people to come to faith in Christ and in Christ alone. And we ought to work ourselves to death to teach people the gospel of Jesus Christ. Apostasy is a real thing. We must be able to recognize it, stop it, Turn it away and not abstain from things that God has created to be good through his word and through prayer. Let's pray. Father, I bow before you this morning. We know that only this can be done through a relationship with Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Father, if, if we remove the gospel, if we remove what Jesus has done for us, then it's just behavioral modification in our lives. We would essentially be in the same place some of these false teachers were in in the day of Paul and Timothy. We've got a few areas and a few compartments of our life cleaned up and looking good, but we're missing the most important thing, which is Jesus, the gospel, which frees us, which liberates us, which gives us the truth. Father, thank you for this sweet congregation, for this church, for the people that serve in this church, for the people that pour themselves into scripture and into wanting to make those gospel relationships and wanting to discipleship and train people for the truth of the word. Father, I pray this morning that we would all put our stake in the ground when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to the word of God, that we would know where we're moving in the future because we know we can't trust anything other than your word. And we know that there's going to be evil forces and things that's going to try to creep in and even change our thinking and get us to justify and say this is okay or that's okay. We can be accepting of this and not this. It may look a little different from dietary foods or from, from abstaining from marriage, but it's still idolatry. And it's still perverting in so many ways. So, Lord, thank you for your love and your grace for us. In Jesus' name, amen.